let's keep moving here. All right. Um, so, so we kind of finished up last time we finished up talking about the semi-endogenous growth theory. We went through those different cases about um, what phi looks like, uh, what that, sorry, that production function for new ideas looks like. And it turned out that a pretty important parameter was, was phi, which controlled how kind of, uh, how much making new technology and ideas depended on old technology and ideas. And it controlled kind of how much more difficult over time does uh, research get, okay? Um, and and we came, we went into like some cases where, you know, kind of the normal case where phi is less than one, things kind of make sense and you need population growth rate to sustain continual growth. Uh, we went like this special case where phi equals one and there you get some possibility of influencing growth with policy, like an R&D subsidy. And then we look at phi greater than one, which is sort of wild singularity land and we kind of rejected that, okay? So um, so that was sort of setting the, ba the baseline. And then from there, uh, let, me, let me pop over to the slides. Um, we started going through some of the kind of what I'm going to call uh, ideas as goods uh, section. OK, so thinking about what, what if we do consider ideas to, to essentially be goods, which could potentially have prices and supply and demand and things like that. And how you know, does that does that conceptual framework sort of hold up, or do we need to add in some new amounts, new elements that make ideas different from regular goods like an apple or a desk or a computer or something like that? Um, and so, yeah. So, so, and, and in essence, and this is following pretty closely uh, the the chapter on ideas in Jones, which is chapter five. Okay, um, chapter five. We'll, we'll be kind of picking up from there. Uh, so, so in essence, um, you, you can you can do that. You just need to, to add in some additional stuff. It, it's kind of stuff that looks as as was mentioned last time. It looks kind of like it makes them look like public goods. Okay, um, there's some differences. You know that you can add some nuance. You can add that would differentiate. Uh, you know this from say something like a traditional public good, like a, a defense or a, a park or something like that. Okay, um, and so the first one. <clears throat> Is, is what we're calling rivalry, okay? Which is to say sort of like, how much does my usage of this good, in this case an idea, interfere with other people's usage, okay? Um, and for a lot of ideas, it really doesn't, okay? So, um, or, and, and here, when I say ideas, I guess here I'm, I'm talking about what we might call knowledge goods, any kind of um, thing like a, a creative output a technical method, uh, maybe, you know, something like a computer program, stuff like that, sort of uh, less tangible types of goods, okay? Um, often people will use the phrase, and even I will use this phrase, like intellectual property or intellectual property policy or even like IPR, if I'm getting really, really uh, acronym heavy. Um, so that, I think that that's decent. I mean, I think it's a little bit loaded because um, you know, there's the question of, is it property or like, it's only really property if you have, um, a government entity enforcing that. And like, I, th I think, so I think it's a little value laden to use the term intellectual property. So I try to avoid it. Um, but yeah, a lot of people say that. So, if, so maybe you'll see it out there somewhere. Okay. So, um, right. So then, so if we're thinking about these, these things, like the, how, how rivals are they? Okay. So, you know, me listening to a song doesn't necessarily interfere with your listening to a song. By the way, I checked out the Childish Gambino, the new, I realize, I, I see now that he has a new album. I thought that was pretty, pretty cool. It's pretty, uh, I think it's pretty wild. And all the songs have like numbers as, as names, which is interesting. Um, so yeah, that was, that, that was a good one. Um, so yeah, but me listening to that didn't really interfere with anyone else listening to that. Okay. And so that's, that's the sense in which it's kind of non-rivalrous. Non whereas um, if I'm if you're using a physical good, it's like you can't use, you know, if I'm writing something with a pencil, you can't simultaneously use that pencil, okay? Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's that's the big thing. And then there's gradations of that. I mean, nothing is a dichotomy. In truth, everything is on a continuum usually. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if you think about <clears throat> kind of, you know, go go back in time a little bit uh, or for like music, for instance, keeping up with the music, uh, uh, topic, um, you know, you have would have music on like a record or something like that. And there, it's like you need a physical manifestation of it, right? So it's not 
it gets a little bit into it like interpretation at that point which is like is the good the song or is it the the record that it exists on um i don't really know but you know in that at least in that case you can think about the notion of a of a duplication cost right so it was the case a long time ago that the duplicating um music was more difficult um and then it's gotten less and less difficult over time once you go to cds and then once you go to digital music it's just almost costless right so 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 that's i would say a place where this this exists on a a, a continuum okay um and then once you get into like um yeah technical methods and things like that i mean you, you know it's it's costly to learn them potentially but it's not you know my using them doesn't interfere with your using them okay at least in the if you were using it for production now once you get to the point of of, of actually like selling goods for instance you know it might be the case that if if i'm using a technical method to produce a, a new type of um good like a computer or something like that if you start using it then you're gonna start selling it which is gonna push the price down which is gonna hurt me at least hurt my profits okay so so there's the thing once you start entering into like a goods uh, market setting where uh there you know there is something that looks like rivalry in the sense that two firms competing against one another are going to lower each other's profits through that competition which which is fine i mean that's that's good in a sense but it's it's a fact okay um okay so so then rivalry is sort of or rather non-rivalry is going to be a, an important feature of uh uh, these these types of goods, okay? Um, and sort of closely linked to that is excludability, which I also mentioned last time. Um, <clears throat> so, so excludability is, is sort of the flip side of rivalry in some sense. It's sort of like actively making, ha having the ability to sort of artificially make goods rivalrous or to, to at least prevent people from uh, using those those ideas, okay? And so that, to get something like excludability, though, you need um, you need to be some someone needs to do something. OK, so usually so it could be um, as is the, the, the sort of prime example would be the patent uh, wherein you come up with a new technology and you apply to the patent office and you say, here's a description of my technology. And there you look around and figure out if you actually are the first person to think of that. And if you are, they grant you a patent. And once you get the patent, which lasts nowadays for about. 20 years then if someone else tries to use your technology you can you can sue them in court and potentially either get damages or get an injunction preventing from preventing them from continuing to do so okay so that's a pretty big thing nowadays um you know lawsuits involving patents you know they can get pretty big like you know uh, i think the, there was a long-standing one with amt amd and intel the processor uh, the semiconductor companies um it lasted like 10 years. They, they spent like billions of dollars on the case. And I don't, I don't, I mean, the, in the end, they came up with some licensing plan, but it, you know, these are really high stakes in a lot of cases, but, but um, that's, that's sort of the, what patents introduce is sort of like this notion of excludability through a, a legal mechanism. Okay. So um, yeah. And so, and the, so once you start to do that, once you, you have this type of excludability, then you can imagine, um, you know that aligning incentives in a, in a in a better way so you know uh if if you you know if i come up with a new idea and i can't do any exclusion and this is a non-rival good just diffuses everywhere everyone can use the idea and i'm not going to internalize many of those benefits i'll internalize whatever benefits accrue to myself but not necessarily everyone else okay at least in terms of like profits so um yeah and so you might think the incentives are, are not properly aligned and if you introduce excludability through something like a patent system then you know at least I, I essentially kind of force people to pay me for using the idea or the product of the idea and so then i'm going to internalize a lot of those benefits through profits and then once you have internalization of of these gains societal gains you would expect more efficient levels of, of investment now when i think oh if i come up with a new idea i may may, may make a ton of money off of doing that um because of the patent system okay so um yeah, so that's that's the basic idea. Uh, there's, you know, and but but it's sort of like the the caveat to that is that it's not always the case that people only think about profits when internalizing stuff. So it could it could be that people enjoy the idea of, of coming up with a new technology that 
diffuses out and helps a bunch of people. In fact, that is absolutely the case in a lot of settings. Um, and because they enjoy it, they actually do internalize in a, in a utility sense, not a profit sense, but in a utility sense, they do internalize those gains um, and are happy to make the investments. So if you look at uh, open source software, for instance, you know that's a, a place or a setting where there's been a ton of sort of development of, of programs, code, technology, and everything like that, more or less um, by random random people. Okay, uh, out there, I'm using mostly open source technology right now on my computer. So um, that that's a setting where you don't have any intellectual property rights. You don't have much excludability at all, uh, and you still get investments that look pretty good. Um, they look, uh, you know, they've, they've changed the, the way the world works a lot uh, for the better. So um, not a necessary thing to have patents, but but in certain settings, it seems like it's probably necessary. So if you look at something like um, pharmaceuticals, you know, uh, well, at least pharmaceutical companies don't seem to be developing drugs just because it makes them feel good. I think, you know, they're pretty profit driven. Um, so, so there's an argument to be made there. Okay. Um, Okay, so that's sort of the, that's the conceptual overview, right? And then the way that um, Jones kind of walks through the implications of this is that um, because of the non-rival nature of these goods and, and in, which is related to sort of the low duplication costs or like a low marginal cost of use, okay? You end up getting um, uh, this set, you end, you, end, you end up getting a dynamic where, um, things look you, you sort of have increasing returns okay so um let me let me hop on over to the whiteboard so i can draw a little graph here okay so um if you have so so think about um a setting where you so this let's see should let's should i do a production function or a cost function um so think think about uh a production function here okay for um units of this idea okay so i'll be more specific in a second so okay i guess this is really just this is just cost okay um how much you're spending and then this is like output okay so um yeah so if, if you Think about uh, the cost. Okay, imagine you're thinking about like total cost here. Okay, so not just like marginal cost, but total cost. Um, and your your our our example here is you're coming up with like a new type of product. Okay, so you're coming up with like a new type of car. That, you know, you're Elon Musk and you're making a Tesla or something. I don't know. So you you do a, a bunch of investment up front. Okay. Um, that's sort of coming up with the idea. So like the research and development phase. Okay. And let's say that that's like a fixed cost you have to pay to create this product. Okay. Um, and then uh, you, uh, so that's F. And so when, if you think about it, like, think about this as a production function, you're putting in resources and you get some output, but the first, when you're putting in these research uh, and development costs, you're not making output yet. Right. So up to this point, you make no output. Right. So if you just developed it and didn't sell anything, you wouldn't make any money. Now, once you uh, um, start making stuff, okay, then you're going to be able to like make a unit of, of this good at sort of a marginal cost, constant marginal cost, and let's say it looks like that, okay. So here now, um, after F, you have some marginal cost. So you're putting in, you're putting in marginal cost here, linearly generating output, okay. So this is so this is your going to be your production function is like along here, okay. That wasn't really a good idea, but um, your production function goes along here and then starts going up at this point. At only after you pay the fixed cost, you start producing, okay? And then, um, so if you think about like, so so the, so, the, so if you look here, um, if you think about average cost, okay? What's gonna be the average cost? Well, for that first unit, it's gonna be pretty high, right? Because you've paid all this, fixed cost and you've done a little bit of production. Okay. And so the average cost here is going to be pretty high. Okay. Let me turn off the ruler. Um, but as you start producing more and more, 
that average cost is going to look lower and lower because you're kind of defraying that fixed cost. You're distributing it over more units, okay? And once you produce a huge amount such that that fixed cost is sort of negligible, your average cost is going to look like uh, your marginal cost, okay? Because you're spreading that fixed cost out over a ton of units, okay? So, so the but the the effect though is that your average cost goes down with um, the the credit scale of production, okay? So that's like kind of that's like increasing returns in a sense, okay? That as you scale up, your average cost goes down. Okay, so anytime you have a fixed cost <clears throat> followed by a marginal cost, that's kind of like increasing returns, reducing lower lower average cost with quantity. Okay, so um, what are the implications for that? Well, I mean, it's going to kind of favor larger firms. It's going to lead to a monopoly situation where you just have one big firm that produces everything at the lowest marginal cost, and everyone else gives up. Okay, and so um, another way to think about it is like. Imagine you had you did have two firms, okay, and uh, they both did this fixed investment to come up with this idea separately, okay, and then they start competing, and they're gonna if they're entering into like real serious competition, they may you know like Bertrand style competition, they're gonna compete down to marginal cost, okay, or maybe you have a bunch of firms, they're gonna compete down to marginal cost. Now if they're charging price equals marginal cost, okay? They're not making any profit margin on, on a particular unit, okay? And they had to pay the fixed cost. So their profit's gonna be like negative F, basically, if they're pricing at marginal cost. Because they're not making any per unit, they pay the fixed cost, their total profit is negative F, okay? And if their total profit's negative F, well then they should never have entered in the first place, right? So they can anticipate that and say, well, we don't wanna do it, okay? So, um, Essentially, like once there's one entrant in the market, then the, everyone else is like, "Well, there's no point in entering." Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna see a monopoly sort of setting here. Okay, when you have when you have this fixed cost because of increasing returns. Anytime you have increasing returns, that's gonna lead to sort of a monopoly. It's gonna tend to lead toward more of a monopoly situation. Okay. Um, okay, so then uh, let's let's jump back to the slides here. Uh, so so that's sort of the argument that that Jones makes is that is that you're gonna get this. Monopoly, okay, um, and you need to somehow deal with that, okay. Um, all right, so, uh, so one thing you can do. So let's think about the the incentives for involved with the with this patenting system, okay. Um, so, so so the pat the the patenting system is sort of like a uh, it's like it's a bargain that people that the policy bargain that people uh, are sort of okay with at this point, which is like, you have some benefits and you have some costs of a patenting system. Okay, so let me, I, I'll just go through the, what it says in the slides in order, okay? So um, the, 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 I mean, but the, the major thing though is that you wanna encourage people to do innovation, okay? So you grant this monopoly, okay, to the, to the firm. Uh, and that can properly align incentives, okay, because they're pulling in all of the sort of social surplus as a monopolist, right? So the monopolist, th though, the problem is that they're they're inefficient. They're they're producing too little, okay, in the immediate sense, okay. So they're producing too little, charging too much, kind of a, if you want to call it a deadweight loss. There's that, okay. So it's, you have these monopoly costs associated with underproduction, uh, but they're also internalizing more of the benefits. So you might think that there's better innovation rates or more efficient innovation rates. Okay. So those are the, that's the, the high, those are the sort of the two most important forces. Okay. So here that, in, okay. So, you know, internalizing benefits, the innovation rate, that's, that's benefit number one. Okay. Um, and the, there's some other ones. Okay. Uh, some other benefits. Okay. So um, one thing is that it, it relates to more like knowledge diffusion. Okay, so if if um, if there was if there was no patent system, firms would probably be rather secretive. Okay, if if they know that if word gets out about this technology, anyone can use it, and there's nothing they can do to stop them, they're gonna be super secretive. They're gonna you know have everyone signs an NDA, whatever. Okay, and non disclosure agreement. So they're legal. They say their employees aren't allowed to talk. Maybe they have like some compound or whatever, you know, uh, I don't know. So that's the thing that happens in the real world. But but if there was no patent system, you'd, you'd think that there'd be even more of it. Okay, so um, 
Now, once you step into a patent world, okay, where you can file for a patent, now you can be a little bit more casual about it because you file for a patent and the patent, you know, let's say the patent office accepts it. They publish that. Okay, so that's the first thing is that they actually publish the patent once it's accepted. So now everyone, can, everyone else can read that, okay? And there can be benefits because now, you know, your, your competitors and people in general know about this technology and that might help them. They might build on it or something like that, okay? Uh, but the firm is, is happy to do that because they know that if someone really just directly steals steals or appropriates their technology, they can sue them, okay? Unless they're not in the U.S. That's a whole other problem. Um, but, you know, assuming, you know, let's say we're one country uh, this is operating in, they can they can prevent people, even if they see it, from using it, okay? So, um, so the net effect is that with a patent system, you might expect people, are, the firms are going to be more open about the, the research that they do. And that can be good because research, we know, is a cumulative process, okay? And so if there's more openness, people can build on that, maybe not on the exact technology, but it can inspire them to do something related or analogous in another field, okay? So so openness is, is, is definitely a benefit, um, a potential benefit from a patenting system, okay? Um, and now the costs, okay, the, so the costs that I mentioned already, the major cost is a monopoly cost, which is pretty well understood. I think I assume you guys have gone over that and variety of classes about about problems with monopolies and inefficient production okay so um, the other cost uh, is a little bit more practical in nature but it's essentially um, that it's not easy to run a patent system okay because or a patent office okay so uh, essentially you know so in the US the the way the patent office works is they have certain standards for what um, constitutes a valid patent okay so they they want it to be sort of non-obvious they want it to be novel which is to say that um it hasn't been done before elsewhere there's no prior art so they call it um and so so if it's those two things then uh and there's some other special cases that we that they have but generally if it satisfies novel and non-obvious then then it can it can become a patent okay it should also be useful i guess so um and so but the problem is that it's not it's not clear what, what is obvious? I mean, to, to a random person on the street, maybe a certain, you know, chemical process or uh, software technique, uh, software programming technique is not um, obvious. It's rather, you know, difficult to understand. But then if you ask any chemist, maybe some idea is obvious. So it's not, it's the question of who, obvious to who is the thing. Um, and even if you decide that it's obvious to a practitioner in the field, it's still not clear, you know, what what really is obvious it's a little bit arbitrary okay so you get some abuse as a result you get people coming out and patenting things that everyone is you know say you know some some technology everyone's been using for years and someone decides to patent it all of a sudden they hold everything up they have to be paid off basically they're extorting people more or less these are called patent trolls so um yeah uh that's that's an issue, okay, and it's it's kind of becoming more of an issue, especially as software patents become more and more popular. Uh, it's it's a big issue, and, and people are some people are not happy about it, okay. So um, so that that's another potential and, and real cost out there, okay. Um, speaking of trolls, I, I figured out how to ban people more easily, so hopefully that won't be as much of a problem. Uh, you can use the text commands, okay. So um, all right, so that's sort of like an overview of the patent system, how that works, okay. Um, Right, so I guess I'm I kind of got ahead of my slides here, but I'm going to try and stick to the slides because I think there's some useful information in here too that I hadn't mentioned before. Okay, so just to go back to like private exclusion, so patenting system is the big one, but there, uh, or to, to exclusion in general, patenting system is the big one, but then there's also sort of like more decentralized private, you know, uh, types of exclusion that individual actors can take rather than governments. Okay, so, and you, you've, you've seen these in some shape or form, I'm sure. So, uh, digital rights management is, is, you know, essentially like encrypting stuff and like locking it down and making sure that you have the right drivers or that your cable is, is certified or something. Essentially it's like, you know, if you, if you watch something on, on Netflix or even if you're watching me now, you could, uh, you could record the screen and then like broadcast that somewhere, broadcast that somewhere else. And it's various methods to like try and prevent that from happening by taking more control over your computer. Um, that's one, um, yeah, but, but, but I mean like the sort of analog old fashioned example, uh, 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 example would be like, you know, at a movie theater, 
you could bring in a video camera and people did this and record the movie and then just sell it to someone else. Um, in that case, it would more be like just checking people for cameras at the door or something. So, um, yeah, so that's one that's very popular now. Um, software, this is analogous software licenses subscription where you, you know, you have to pay continually for software and you have like a key that you have to have and you have to like update that and making sure that you don't just copy the software to another computer and use it there because it's obviously very easy to copy software and they want to try and get, they want to get money for every time you use it basically. Okay. So that's another one. Um, another one that's kind of interesting, uh, but potentially problematic, um, is, is re relates to genetically modified organisms in this case, seeds for plants. Okay. So you got a company like Monsanto is sort of the big player in this field. They, uh, so, so the issue is the, the broad issue is you want to, you're a farmer, you want to plant some stuff, but when you plant the stuff, you get, um, insects, pests and things like that, that, uh, attack your crops. Okay. And this is a big deal, not just the U S even more so in, 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 uh, other countries and especially in less developed countries. So, uh, one thing you can do is use pesticides. Okay. Problem is that some pesticides are bad for the plants. So. What you do is you also genetically modify the plants so that they're resistant to the pesticide and then you use the pesticide. Plants are okay. The pests are not. Okay. That's the intent. Um, and that's, that's how it works. So these genetic, so now you got these genetically modified seeds that firms like Monsanto are selling. Now here you get into the, the copying costs. Seeds are pretty good at cop and plants are pretty good at duplicating themselves. Uh, by selection. So when, you know, the seed grows, you buy it once, you know, in, in a particular world, you buy it once, you get the seed, you grow, you grow the plant, it survives, and then it makes other seeds, and then you could plant those. Okay. And now Monsanto is not happy about this. They want to keep selling you seeds over time. They want to do the software licensing thing, but with plants, right? Uh, so what they also do um, is they, they can modify the seeds to make plants that don't make seeds. Okay. Um, or something like that. Okay. So <clears throat> that's like DRM with genetics. Okay. So that, that's sort of a more modern kind of thing now there. Um, the, and so, so yeah, so that's what they do. It's in it. The problem is that sometimes, well, not really a problem, but the thing is that sometimes it doesn't work and they actually do produce seeds and then farmers use them. Even in that case, then they have legal agreements and they try to sue the farmers and it turns into a real big deal. But, um, that's the basic idea. Okay. Um, and then the last one on this list is trade secrecy. So I already talked about that, which is just like, you know, it, you know, trying to enforce secrecy rather than using patents per se. Okay. All right. Um, okay. And then, so increasing returns, I already talked about this. I already went, went over that in, in fair, fair amount of detail. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep moving from that. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, All right, so so we're gonna so so the other thing um, that that's gonna be important here uh, we already I mean we already saw this we already saw that um, population is closely related population growth is closely related to economic growth okay so when we did that yes um, on Monday when we did that um, semi endogenous model of Jones we saw that you could only get in the five less than one case you can only get long term growth if you have population growth. Okay. Um, and kind of, kind of what leads to that is, is some notion of increasing returns. Okay. So, you know, the idea is, um, with, with these ideas, really the, it's kind of like the best idea that matters the most. Okay. So you, if everyone comes up with a way to solve a problem and there's one way that's just obviously best, we're going to use that. And what matters is how good the best one is. Okay. And that dynamic induces increasing returns at sort of like a societal level in the sense that uh, if you double, uh, so, so if you double the amount of people in a society and, you, and, and that results in a doubling in the number of potential uh, ideas or solutions to a problem, the best amongst all of those is going to be higher when you, after you double the population, right? So, you know, think about you know, you double the population, you kind of, you double the probability that one of those people is Einstein is going to come up with like special and general relativity. Okay. So, um, that that's increasing returns because with, with most, with normal goods, you double the population, you double the, uh, output, um, 
but that's sort of like a, a things just scale up linearly, okay? Whereas um, in this with ideas, you double the population and you actually double, you, you increase productivity, okay? So you come up with better ideas and that increases productivity. So each person is more productive as well. Whereas when in the regular world, pe people don't change their productivity when you double the size of the, the population, okay? So, so that's the notion of increasing returns is that doubling the population leads to better and better ideas. And that's encoded essentially in what, um, what the, that production function for ideas is kind of embedded in there mathematically, but that's the intuition, okay? Um, and the, I think it's interesting also because it's, it runs exactly opposite to what we talked about with Malthus, okay? Where uh, increasing population put more and more strain on fixed resources like land, uh, and that led to immiseration, okay? So this is the exact opposite where you increase population. Now you sort of have these increasing returns uh, and, and things can get better and better, okay? Um, now, if there was a fixed factor that started to sort of show up, okay? Like land isn't really a fixed factor at this point in, in, in human population, okay? Um, but you could think about, am I... Okay, Possible, possibly some lag, hopefully not too much, okay? Um, you can think about a fixed factor, like an environmental factor, right? So think about like the climate, okay? Um, that's obviously being impacted by people. And if we uh, double the population, that would probably make things much worse, okay? So so once you get into like fixed factors and, and, and environmental degradation and stuff like that, then maybe you want to start thinking a little bit like that, but um, yeah, that doesn't mean that the answer to climate change is to limit population necessarily. It's probably to make better clean technology, but you know, you could have a situation where fixed factors become sort of a bottleneck. Okay. So, but, but, but for our, you know, talking about ideas, let's stay focused here. Uh, you have this notion of increasing returns. Okay. All right. So, so that's sort of the conceptual overview. Okay. Uh, I've got a question. Does the comparison have to be Weighted uh, to adult. Well, it seems like you wouldn't be able to make comparison between LDC uh, twice the population of ADC. So um, let me think. So LDC here is less developed country, and then DC is developed country. Uh, so you're talking about? Um, are we talking about ideas? Or are we talking about the the climate example in this particular case? Um, I guess. Ideas. Okay, so yeah. Um, it, so so the so we're we'll talk about ideas. How do you know? So is are the difference between less developed and developed in that in that sense. So I mean, it is true that um, sort of a lot of frontier technological growth comes from more developed countries uh, to an extent, right? So I mean, like a lot of research happens in the U.S. Um, a lot of research happens in Europe, a lot of research happens in China, more, more and more nowadays. Um, so yeah, I mean, th there's a, there's some truth to that. I think, I think there's also, there's also a sense in which that, that technology isn't just a uh, sort of unidimensional, uh, where you just sort of get better and better over time, you know, it's like different technologies are useful for, for different people in different settings. Um, so like if you look at less developed countries, you know, they had issues with banking and they didn't have a, 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 like a super well-developed financial system uh, or banking system. Uh, and so they, they kind of innovated in a way that you didn't see initially in, in more developed countries, which was using mobile phones for banking and things like that. Now, eventually we did see that um, in, in more developed countries, but it, it, I think it became much more of a thing in less developed countries first. And so it's like you sort of using technology in a different way. Okay. And then you also have stuff like, you know, water purification without reliable power sources using like ultraviolet and things like that. So, um, sort of like different technologies that are sort of different suited to different settings. Um, and then of course, like disease is going to be another big, like curing diseases and stuff like that. So, so once you start thinking about, um, technology, maybe it's not exactly unidimensional, then, then it's sort of just like, you know, you double population and maybe you, you increase research happening in whatever research they're geared towards. That's still going to be true, but where they're geared towards might differ based on, uh, might differ from country to country, right? Um, okay, yep. Uh, okay, so then um, let's, 
let's let's move ahead. So so that that's a conceptual overview, and so now I kind of want to go into like sort of a more detailed model that that captures a lot of this stuff. Okay, now this is a pretty um, classic, I would say, model. Probably heard the the name Romer, Paul Romer. He just won the Nobel Prize recently, basically for this, for some other stuff, but a lot of it was for this this kind of uh, work that he did uh, looking at. At growth and, and returns to scale, increasing returns and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. So he was. Let's see. What is he? He was. He, I mean, he's an economist. I think he, he was head of research at the World Bank until recently, and I forget, I forget what he's up to now. But he's 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 an interesting fellow. Okay. So um, so here's here's the general idea. Um, so what? And this is more of a preface to the Roma model. Um, Kind of what we want to do is is at this stage is, is is add more detail at the micro level. So like a lot of what we've been doing, I mean, this is a macro class, so maybe that's not surprising, but a lot of what we've been doing has been using models that are that are what's called aggregate models. We're, we're just looking at aggregates like the total population L, the total amount of capital, the total output, and we're positing relationships between them, okay, and then seeing how they evolve, right? That can be a good first step. Um, Excuse me. Um, that can be a good first step, but it is the case that um, micro details matter in a lot of settings. Okay, so if you have a certain amount of capital K, then it might matter whether that capital is owned by one firm and they're operating it versus being owned by many different smaller firms. Okay, so like the market structure and the micro structure are going to be important. And once we get into um, something like innovation where you need to think about the incentives to innovate and how that relates to the competitive landscape in, in the markets that these firms are operating, um, that gets more and more important. Okay. And so it's so sort of out of necessity, we have to start thinking about things at the micro level. Okay. Um, and so that, yeah, that nexus between competition and innovation is really important. If you have like a monopoly firm in a particular industry, they may just sort of kind of sit back and not innovate because they're already a monopolist. What are they going to do? They already have all the market share. Um, and uh, Versus if you have many smaller firms, you might expect they're sort of jockeying for a position and constantly trying to make better technology. So so that uh, micro market structure is going to be important for the incentive to, to innovate and how and as a result for the actual innovation that occurs. Okay, so that's the basic idea. We want to we wanna micro found this stuff. That's, so that's called micro foundations. We come up with a micro model. Later on, we'll, we'll map it out into its aggregate implications once again, um, but but the, the real action is happening at the micro level, okay? So um, that's this is a kind of a big thing. It's like a thing that's been happening in, in macroeconomics research in the past, I don't know, 20, 30 years. Uh, the micro founding things and making sure that they, they make sense at the micro level. You could also call it sort of a macro micro synthesis in some sense. Um, they're still separate in a lot of ways, but like there, there has been more sort of convergence there. Okay. Um, okay. So, so what we're going to do is the Roman model. This is in, this is, this is also, this is what Jones uses in chapter five. Okay. So um, if you want to, I use, I changed the notation a little bit just cause like there are certain things I didn't like. I just want to kind of try and simplify it. Um, but it, you'll be able to see, I mean, they're, they're only minor changes. The basic structure is the same. Okay. So, um, but I'm going to give you a little sort of diagrammatical, if that's a word, uh, uh, overview uh, on the whiteboard here, and then we can jump back into to the slides if, if necessary. Okay. So, um, all right. Okay. So, let's go down here. Uh, so, so this is this is going to be the Romer model. Um, let's 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 sort of hash out what the elements that we're dealing with here are. So. Uh, Rumor model. So what we're gonna we're, let me let me see what, what we're gonna have. Um, we're gonna have a lot of the same kind of familiar faces, like output y. Okay, um, we're gonna have labor l. Okay, so this is all. This this is like production. My handwriting is not so good in this setting. Uh, this is production labor. So the, the new thing that's happening here is that there's a certain population, okay? And everyone in the population can either, they have to work, sorry. They can either uh, do pr what's called production labor, making goods, uh, 
in the traditional sense, or they can do research labor, which is like coming up with new ideas. Okay, so the big um, so the, the production and then R is uh, research. The big societal choice that's being made is between production and research. Okay, so we're gonna have one equals L plus R. So there's gonna be a fixed amount of one sort of mass of people, like 100%, I guess you could say. Uh, some percentage or fraction is gonna be doing production and some fraction is gonna be doing research, but yeah, everyone's working. That's the whole population, okay? So, um, and then, so production is gonna produce goods in a kind of solo style, right? Um, and then research is going to generate new ideas and it's and specifically it's going to generate like new types of goods, new varieties of goods. Okay. So like, you know, think about like smartphones or different types of software or things like that. Maybe they're niche goods, sort of like a long tail stuff, but it's just like new varieties of goods. Okay. So that's going to be a thing. All right. Uh, we're still going to have capital. Uh, still be denoted with K. All right. That's going to be kind of used for production still, okay? Um, and uh, I think that's it for now, okay? So um, now, all right, so, so and then here's how the, the production system is gonna work. So think about like you, uh, you wake up, you're the economy today, um, and you're gonna do some production. Uh, you have, I forgot to say, the number of goods, N. That's, that's like a wonky N. Okay, so like we want a non wonky n. Uh, there we go. Okay, so this is going to be number of like varieties of goods. Okay, so this is like a measure of how many cool gizmos are out there that you can buy that make you happy. All right, um, and that's going to be growing over time. That's going to basically constitute growth. Okay, so um, so so you you wake up, right? Essentially, what you do is you have a bunch of capital and labor lying around, and you split that amongst various different little firms that produce these gizmos okay and they produce the gizmos and then you kind of like combine all the gizmos into one like synthetic good that people consume so it's like you know you can think about them consuming directly but you combine them all into one good people consume that that makes them happy that gives them utility um okay um but then also uh that output they don't consume all of it i should say they consume some of it and then the other stuff they invest, just like in solo, they invest it into to capital, okay? And we'll say that this, as in solo, they just invest a fixed fraction, okay? So in the back, this is really a generalization of solo, right? We have solo, it's just that like how production works exactly is a little bit different, okay? So like essentially like you have a certain amount of capital today, okay? You, let's see how my drawing skills hold up here. Those should be relatively straight. So what you're gonna do is like, this is supposed to be like a fan. So you're gonna like distribute that capital amongst different firms, okay? And each of these firms is gonna produce a different variety. And then we're gonna combine all those together uh, into one Y, okay? So we're gonna call these like different XIs, okay? Different varieties, okay? And there's there's uh, N of those, right? So uh, zero is less than or equal to I less than or equal to n. Okay, so there's n varieties that are indexed by i, and we're splitting capital up amongst all those firms, okay? They're like factories or machines or something, okay? They're, they're, they're doing all that production. It all gets funneled and aggregated into one thing, final good, y, okay? And then that y is split between consumption and investment, okay? And then uh, what's happening over time? Well, over time, Uh, we're accumulating more capital, so that investment, right, which is S times Y, like in solo, is going into new capital, and the capital also depreciates at rate delta. So that's 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 the solo stuff still happening, okay. So then K goes up over time, potentially, and then it gets split again, produced. Some of that goes to investment, more capital or less capital in the future, okay. So um, that's one, and then also there's um new products, new ideas. Okay, so this is more like, this is the new stuff, all right? And, but, but you can think about, you know, when we, when we talk about the production function for ideas and that Jones big thing last, last class, it's, it's like that, except instead of A, I'm gonna call it N because it's like number of products, but it's really similar to like A. Um, and uh, 
yeah, so the way that Jones writes it, he has this weird notation where it's like some constant times are the amount of research. Okay. So you put in, you, 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 you say, okay, some fraction, remember some fraction of people work as researchers. They have a certain like productivity that leads to new, uh, uh, products. Okay. Those new products kind of expand this thing out. So this is like from zero to N, right? They make more varieties here and then those go into final, final good. Okay. So, um, that's the basic idea. So like kind of solo happening in the background. And now we have people doing research. They're, uh, coming up with new types of goods and that's sort of like expanding the, the types of goods that you can buy as a consumer. And then, um, yeah. So, uh, theta, we'll talk about how, where that comes from later on. That's going to be a little more complicated, but for now you can just think like researchers go in, new ideas come out. Very simple game. All right. Um, <clears throat> okay. Now there's kind of like one thing I haven't really a hundred percent like explained is like, why, why is having more varieties of goods better? Okay. So it's like, it's like a good thing, right? In general, it's better to have more options. Okay. But what's the exact mechanism or way in which that makes things better off? Okay. So that's actually important and somewhat intricate. Okay. So, uh, we're going to do that. Okay. So, um, let's, uh, let's do that. Okay. So, so to do that though, I need to tell you more about what is this, aggregation here how are we aggregating all of these like xi's into one final good okay so that's and that's going to be our production function so the production function is always important no less true right now perhaps even more true than than ever okay so this is the production function is the way that we aggregate things okay um all right so uh so how does that work? How do we aggregate these these xi's? So I'll just give it to you. So we're gonna have y output um, is gonna be equal to l to the one minus alpha. Okay. So this 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 looks like what we do before, right? L to the one minus alpha, k to the alpha, right? But now instead of having k to the alpha, we're gonna have an integral over all these different goods. So we're integrating from zero to n of xi. To the alpha di okay so so now let's let's try and kind of unpack what this means right um so the integral the 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 way that you know kind of so 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 what what you know we've seen integrals before obviously but like the, the way that it's used in these sort of aggregations is a little bit different i think from what people's intuition about integration is generally so you know the way that Jones describes it, and I think this is pretty good, is like, think about like, so this is like sum. This is like you're adding a bunch of stuff from like i equals one to n. Okay, so let's say you just had like one, two, three, four, five, six discrete goods, okay? And then you're adding up all these xi. This is like xi to the alpha. Okay, so so all the integral is, is just sort of like, it, instead of having, you know, discrete integers one through n, okay, you just have like, now you have like one, one and a half, two, two and a half, and then you have thirds and fourths and you just fill it out and you're, you're going to a continuous setting. Okay. So it's just like summing up the contributions of each and it just, I just, there's like a continuum of them. Um, it just makes things easier, uh, like sort of mathematically to work through. If you have sums, things get kind of messy and, and yeah. So, so this is, you can think about this as just a sum, except it's over a continuum. Okay. Um, all right. So. Now let's think about like what's going on here, right? Uh, so first of all, alpha, what is alpha doing? Alpha is still doing the same thing it always does. It's mediating between labor and capital. Okay, so we're even gonna see that the labor share is gonna be one minus alpha as we saw before. So this is alpha is saying, if alpha is zero, then the exercise don't really matter that much, okay? Uh, and labor is all important. If alpha is one, then labor's not important at all. Everything happens with uh, capital, these capital goods. Okay, so it's still doing the same thing, except it's also kind of aggregating over all these XIs. Okay, the other thing, so, so the the is a little bit funky here because alpha is doing two things at the same time. It's mediating between capital and labor like it used to do in solo, and it still does now. 
but it's also kind of like mediating between the different goods, right? Like the different XIs. Okay. And what that what that what that really is is like the amount of substitutability between these different goods. Okay, so you've got a bunch of different products that you can buy. Okay. Some of them are more substitutable or less substitutable, right? Different I don't know, different types of like tomato sauce, you know, marinara versus whatever. I don't know. They all seem the same to me. Um, those are like more substitutable, uh, like the toothpaste example or whatever. Um, but then some of the products are just, they're just totally different, right? Um, you can't substitute them for one another. All right. They just do different things. Okay. So that's what, so alpha is like, if alpha was equal to one, then here, if alpha was equal to one, this would be like a linear integral or like a linear sum. And a linear sum is just, things are perfectly substitutable. One more, one, one less of the other doesn't make a difference. It's just totally substitutable. So, so when alpha equals one, these things are all super substitutable. As alpha goes to zero, okay, they become like very not substitutable, okay? Because essentially, um, if you think about like, if alpha, if alpha goes to zero, your marginal product is gonna be like super steep and then it'll level up, okay? So just having like a little bit gets you a long way, okay? It's like a, a necessity, right? You, you need to have uh, food. You need to have these things. Like the, some things are, you just, you gotta have them, all right? If you're gonna maintain any semblance of humanity. Um, so uh, as alpha goes to zero, these things get more sort of necessary and less substitutable. And, and, and from then on, that, that's gonna be important actually, because and it's gonna be important because the, um, the firms producing these are gonna be monopolists. Okay, the firms producing each individual XI here, these guys operating here are gonna be monopolists because they get patents on these ideas. We're, we're assuming there's like a patent system, okay? So these guys have their, their job, they're a firm, they produce one type of good, good number 163, uh, toothpaste, and they're a monopolist, okay? And they produce a certain amount and sell it, okay? So, um, if they're in a, if goods are highly substitutable, they're not going to be able to charge much of a markup over cost because if you increase your price a little bit that you can, someone can just go down the street and buy from someone else. Okay. So, um, if, so, so if they're highly substitutable, which means that alpha is close to one, we're going to get like efficient style pricing. Okay. Marginal cost pricing, uh, as alpha goes to zero, they're very not substitutable. Then, um, you're going to see much higher prices, okay? Uh, because they know that they 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 can do that, and, and you have nowhere else to go. So when you know, as alpha goes to zero, then you enter sort of this, you know, uh, if you remember this Martin Shkreli guy who was selling some drug that was needed for a rare disease, it's like that's not substitutable. You're going to jack up the price, okay? So um, yeah, that's the, the 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 reason it's important is because it determines pricing, and that's going to have implications down the line, okay? So. Um, yeah. So, but but the the essentialized sort of like loop system here, as things evolve over time, that's 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 how we're gonna work. Okay. Um, all right. So, got about twenty minutes here. Uh, we're not gonna be able to solve the whole model, but we can get part of the way. All right. So. Um, okay. I think I might. I I don't. This so the, this this stuff is reflected in the. The slides as well. Um, go through all that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, do it on the whiteboard. But if you know if you if it's easier for you to go back to the slides rather than just going through the video again, uh, you know that's probably probably one of the better ways. Okay. So um, but let's just we can just do it here and derive things. Okay. So um, we need to. There are a lot of steps in solving this model. Okay. So this is sort of like this is our most ambitious effort yet probably will be our most ambitious modeling effort for the class. Okay, so so bear with me. Um, but at the end of the day, we'll get kind of, the, the cool thing is that it's a, cons, you know, it, it's going beyond solo, it's endogenizing ideas. Things get more complicated, but they don't get like out of control crazy. Okay, we can still like solve for things in closed form, um, get like neat solutions, see how different things affect stuff. Um, maybe get a little bit understanding of, of policy and how you might design policy for like a research subsidy or something like that. So yeah, so you, things get more complicated, but, but there are some benefits. There's some gains from, from going into a more complex environment. Okay. So, um, all right. So, so think about these, where'd my cursor go? So we're, we're going to call this like, um, 
the firm problem, the problem of the firm, the optimization problem. Essentially figuring out what are what are firms gonna do? Okay, what are these firms gonna do? All right, now, um, uh, and when I say firms here, I mean like the, the firm I, okay? They're, they're the, 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 the firms producing these XIs that get aggregated, okay? So there's a bunch of these different firms, there's N of them, okay? Um, what are they gonna do? Well, here, here's how it happens. They set a price. They announce, I'm selling my good today for price PI, okay? Price PI, okay? And then what happens is they announce their price PI. This is like an assumption actually, like you know, mar market structure is complicated. We're gonna say this is like called price posting. You post the price and people come in and buy. Seems actually pretty reasonable. Um, so uh, you post some price PI and then some amount of, that's gonna do some demand. This would be like, this is an inverse demand function we're talking about here. So you post a price PI, if you post a really high price, maybe not that many people buy. If you post a really low price, maybe more people buy. That makes sense. Um, now, who are you selling to exactly? Well, the, the assumption here is like, essentially we're like selling to, to some aggregation firm, like, I don't know, like Walmart or Target, right? So like these these firms, these little firms produce their, their gadgets XI, they sell the, to Target. If you like, it takes a bunch of labor and aggregates that all together into like a store and that makes like output. Okay, so it's a, it's a little funky, it's not perfect as an abstraction, but it's, it, it works, okay, so so that's that's the, the way it works. So you, you set you post a price P and then these aggregating you know big box stores or whatever turn that into final good. That final good can then either either be invested or uh, consumed by consumers. okay um, Yeah, so then the question is how much are people how much are these people gonna buy? If, if I pro what I want to know as a firm XI, if I press price post price PI, then how much XI am I gonna sell? Which then will determine my revenues, my profits. Okay. Um, so we what we need is a, a, a demand function or an inverse demand function. Okay. And and we can get that, okay, um, by considering what 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 would this these this aggregation firm do? Okay, so remember there's there's these little firms XI, and then there's the aggregation firm. Okay, so the aggregation firm will think, okay, I can buy some some additional XI that's gonna push up Y, and I can sell that, um, but then I have to pay PI per unit. Okay, so the aggregation firm is, the, like any firm that we're discussing here, gonna maximize their profits. Okay, so, um, I mean, in essence, yeah, they're gonna maximize their profits. Okay, so uh, we can just go from here. So what does that mean? Um, they're gonna, you know, maximize y minus what they spend on all these goods. Okay. So they they buy xi of each. Good I should get closer to the mic. Um, they buy XI units of each good, they pay a price P, so this is how much they're paying for a good I, and then you integrate that over all the goods. Okay. And essentially what what that means though is that you know they're, they're what they're gonna do is they're gonna set price equal to the marginal product of I. Price equals marginal product. Okay, so that's it's the same thing as any any old demand function. Price equals marginal product. Okay, but you know this, um, like, but but really, you know, you don't have to start with price equals marginal product. You can just say, okay, well, what if you take a derivative of this, max o like max over xi. If you take a derivative of this, you get del y del xi, which is the marginal product of x of xi for good i uh, minus so you only, if you so you're taking the derivative with respect to xi, so you only pick up that pi, so minus pi, zero. Okay, so so price, so and and this is marginal product. So 
Price equals marginal product is just saying they're choosing optimally. They're choosing how much to buy optimally. Okay. Now, um, what is marginal product? Okay, which is so marginal product is del y del xi. What is marginal product? Um, good question I asked myself. Uh, it's the derivative of y with respect to xi. Okay. So if you take that derivative, you're going to get L to the one minus alpha. Okay. And now remember this, this, this is a little confusing. So this is an integral over like all goods from zero to N. Okay. We're taking the derivative with respect to exactly one good, good number 0.37724, or, you know, 7.8, whatever. So it's a very specific good in here. So we're only going to pick up that XI and all the other ones are unchanged. Okay. So this is going to look like, uh, that derivative is going to, it's just going to be alpha times XI to the alpha minus one. Okay. All right. So you get this constant here and then you pick up XI. So you get alpha xi to the alpha minus one. Okay. And that's uh, at optimum going to be equal to pi. Okay. So, um, so this is, so already right here, this we, we're going kind of backwards, but already right here, this is an inverse demand function in the sense that it's telling us if, if we produce X, okay. And we want to sell all of it, we should, choose price PI if we want to sell that much or like if we produce X, we're going to be able to sell it for PI. Okay. So that's an inverse demand function. If you want to think about it the other way, it's kind of equivalent, but if you want to think about it the other way, you can solve. So you can say, okay, well, move that alpha down here, move the alpha over here. And on the right, this is just L over XI to the one minus alpha. So we're just combining these two because they have the same exponent. Okay. Um, Cool. And then uh, let's shift that one minus alpha over here. So we get on the left one over one minus alpha and on the right we get XI. All right. And then let's solve for XI. That's what we want to do. So we solve for XI, then we're going to get XI. So move XI over here and move this over here. So we're going to get L to the alpha over PI. Okay, so now this is our demand. This is so this is inverse demand, and this is true demand saying if we post price p, how much are we going to sell? All right, so that's what we want to know. Um, okay, so so this is important, I guess. You know, this function here. Uh, also, this you know, so so the inverse demand. If you, if you want to write the inverse demand in a little bit cleaner way, you'd say pi is equal to alpha l over xi to the one minus alpha. Okay, so l over xi. All right. So so this would be like our inverse demand. So this is this is going from p to x. This is going from x to p. These are equivalent. It's just a one to one mapping. So it doesn't matter which way you go. Um, and so so that's good. All right, so this is so so remember this is coming from that aggregation firm. Let's scroll up here. This is saying if we want to sell this this aggregation, this Walmart target place, um, here's the demand function we're facing. Okay. And that's that's that was that's an input into the, the the problem of these little XI firms. These are like niche firms producing their, their gizmos. Okay. So now they know. Okay, so I'm gonna that was like a sidebar sort of. Okay. So this is like firm XI. Okay, so now they know, uh, let's say let's say they know PI of XI. They know as a function how much, uh, what, what price they're gonna be able to charge if they wanna sell XI, okay? Um, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna be what PI, this function here, you know, it's just gonna be some like, kind of like one over X looking function of how much you wanna sell how much you're going to be able to charge for it. Okay. Very standard. Not going to be like the linear one that we usually see, but it's going to be like a one over X kind of looking thing. All right. Um, okay. So what does that get us? Well, now we can think about 
the profit. Okay, so let's say the profit of firm I, um, if they choose price PI, well, they're gonna get some revenue, price times quantity. And here, quantity is a function of the price that they choose, right? And then they're gonna, um, they have costs, okay? Turns out it costs money to produce things. Um, and uh, in this case, they're gonna use capital to produce things, okay? So they're gonna like rent some capital at rate R, which is R for a reason, it's the interest rate, the rental rate on capital. Uh, and they need to do that proportionally. So essentially the assumption is to make an amount XI, they need to get XI capital. It's just a linear one-to-one -one production. You get XI worth of capital that produces XI, okay? And each unit of that capital costs R which is the interest rate, okay? Um, so then, uh, Jordan, what up? Uh, this is the undergrad class, this is my undergrad class. This is like right before yours. Uh, come back at three. Or you can stick around and watch about profit maximization. We're doing the Romer model. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I, I'll, I, I should give this disclaimer. All my, all my classes are in the, same Twitch stream and there's no way to differentiate. So you, if you get a, uh, yeah, see they're, they're enjoying it. Um, no problem. Uh, so yeah, you, if you have notifications, you're gonna get notifications for all my classes. So just keep that keep that in mind. Um, okay, so, uh, so this is our profit. Okay, so this is saying, so now we know, like like symbolically at least, you know, if you're, if you're choosing, you're, you wanna choose price P uh, to maximize profit. Okay, so, and if you choose a higher price, you're gonna sell a little bit less, okay? Uh, but then you're getting more per unit, so that's the classic kind of revenue issue. And then you're also gonna be producing more, you got more costs, okay? So the, this is a standard profit maximization. I'm just kind of going through all the nuts and bolts in this particular setting, okay? Um, okay, so then, okay, so we wanna get, we wanna max pi i, we wanna, uh, maximize profit. We want to choose the price that gives us maximal profit. All right. Um, I, for now, I, I don't like drawing so many eyes. So I'm just going to drop the eyes. I'm going to write like pi of p. I'm going to write p of x. All this stuff just dropping eyes because we know that it's we're we're thinking about one particular firm i, and we're just going to drop i for now. Okay. So then it's like we're maximizing over p of p times x of p. So yeah. We're, we're, we're dropping all of these on these these various functions. Uh, P time, times X of P minus R times X of P, right? Or, you know, you could factor it out and say it's just price minus R. So this is price minus cost of the profit margin. Okay. Ah, right. I always draw behind my, my, uh, my head and don't realize it. Okay. Two page after. Here we go. Okay. Thanks for uh, pointing that out. Okay. Uh, Okay, so then we got the profit margin, price minus cost, and then uh, the quantity, okay? So that's another way to just factor out X and P, okay? Um, all right, so now, so this, so, so, so here's the thing. We know, we know what X of P looks like from here. So like, just, just rewriting that, that demand function X of P, we know it to be L times alpha over P to the one over one minus alpha. Okay. Now we could plug that in here, take derivatives, and it's gonna be a little ugly. Or we could keep it like this. Okay. Um and uh go from there and, and do it symbolically. Okay. Now I should should also note uh the way that Jones does it. So, so anytime you have a setting like this, where you have like a demand function linking price and quantity, okay, you can say, well, I'm choosing P maximally and do all this stuff. Or you could also frame it as a problem of choosing X maximally because X and P are, are linked one to one. They're the same thing basically. So you could also say, well, this is actually, profit is actually P of X times X, right? So this is the same thing except we're, we're choosing X now minus R X. Okay, maybe that's better. That's, that's a little simpler actually. So this is, we factored out P of X minus R 
times x. Okay, so these, these are these are equivalent. We're just whether we do demand or inverse demand is the question. Okay, this is the way that Jones does it. And actually, maybe I should just stick with what Jones does in the book. So you guys, so so we're consistent. Um, all right, so so we're almost out of time here. So I'll just give you. Um, I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly, and then we can we can circle back to it next time. So, what we're going to find is you, we we can figure out pretty well what their pricing strategy is here. So the, the the elasticity of demand is going to determine their pricing strategy. The more elastic demand is, uh, essentially, the lower price that they're going to have to charge because they're fake. Yeah, um, you'll see. So so what happens if we do that? So we're going to take a derivative. And set it to zero. Okay, so we're going to zero equals the derivative of this. Let's say this thing. Okay, so it's just profit. It's profit margin times quantity. That's that's profit, right? So derivative of the first times the second. So derivative of the first is p prime of x. The r is constant. Okay, so it's just the derivative of this is p prime of x times x. So this is saying you get a little bit less per unit if you sell more, but you also sell more units. Uh, plus the first, okay, so that's p of x minus r times the derivative of the second, which is just one. Okay, so that's saying you, you sell more. So this is this is accounting for the reduction in price. This is accounting for the fact that you sell more. Okay, so those are going to counterbalance at the optimum. Okay, um, cool. And then uh, what does that what does that get us? All right, so. Um, how should we do this? So, so we're going to be a little bit clever here and, and divide this whole thing by P. Okay. So first let's, um, let's, uh, let's, let's turn this into equality. So this is saying P of X minus R should be equal to minus P prime of X times X. All right. Um, let's divide by P of X. So this is saying like, the profit margin divided by the price. So this is like some measure of, of your, your profit per mirror markup over cost. Um, it's going to be equal to what? So when you divide by P, you get P prime of X times X over P of X. Okay. So this, um, this here, this is like the derivative of a function times its input variable divided by its output variable. This is what's known as an, el an elasticity, right? So you guys have heard elasticity, like demand elasticity before. This is like the technical proper definition of an elasticity of a function, okay? And it turns out if you, so so remember that um, our inverse demand function was P of X is equal to alpha L over XI to the one minus alpha. Okay, so this is inverse demand. Um, it turns out that if you calculate this quantity here for this p of x function, you're going to get exactly 1 minus alpha. You're going to pick up, an elasticity just picks up the, the exponent on xi, which is minus 1 minus alpha, and then that kills off at the minus. So I'll go through the, the details later, um, but it turns out that you get exactly that. So, so what it's saying basically is that you're going to um, uh, charge a constant markup over cost. So you're going to charge... You're gonna say, skipping a couple steps here, which I'll which I'll go through next time. You're gonna charge a price of R over alpha, okay? And that um, so your your marginal cost is R, alpha is less than one, so you're gonna charge more than your marginal cost. So you actually make some money. Um, and when alpha equals one, remember that was perfect substitutes. You charge exactly marginal cost, and as alpha, as they become less and less substitutable, your price goes up and up, and then it goes to infinity with alpha equals zero. Okay, so so that's um, so it's like substitutability determines the, the price markup and profits. That's going to be the story next time. And then once we have these prices, once we get profits, we can start thinking about what's the incentive to create new products and make more profits. And that's when we think about the research decisions of firms. Okay, so that's going to be kind of the road ahead, and that'll lead to to actual growth.